here in Mission Control. We're now looking towards an alternate mission. Five and a half hours after an explosion crippled their spaceship, the crew of Apollo 13 was riding in a lifeboat. Three men in a lunar module meant for two. The LEM was designed to carry them just 60 miles from lunar orbit to the surface. Now they had to use the LEM's rocket in a way its designers never intended, to steer them around the moon and set their course for Earth, a quarter million miles away. Did you ever have any doubts about whether you could accomplish it? Well, naturally, I think everybody does uh, in a situation like this. They had a tiny margin for error and no second chances. It's not just dying, Jim. It's the kind of death. It's, and I've thought about this, it's running out of oxygen and drifting in space perhaps forever. How did you deal with those thoughts? Oh, we didn't think about what the final results would be if we weren't successful. What would finally get to us? Running out of uh, all kinds of electrical power? Getting onto an orbit that we couldn't correct? And be in an orbit around the Earth for hundreds of years? You left one out. You could come in too steep into the Earth's atmosphere and burn up. I would have rather have done that. We now show a velocity of 3,210 uh, feet per second. Did you allow yourselves to have those emotional discussions? Did anybody start talking about family? And what if? What if we don't make it back? To ourselves, we thought about family, not to each other. You didn't bring that up? We, no, uh, we did not bring that up. Uh, and we, we did not because we did not want to get emotionally d uh, disturbed or challenged from the job that we had to do. But for the families, there was no other job. You wanted life to go on as normal, but in your heart, it couldn't have been anything close to normal. No. Friends of mine told me that I was in a daze, really. The house was packed, and I just had to be by myself, and I, I just left everyone, and I got into the bathroom, and I kneeled on the tile floor and prayed. It was much worse for the level kids at school. And everybody came up to me and said, I'm so sorry, your dad's going to die. April 14th, 21 hours after the explosion, the crippled ship rounded the far side of the moon. In the midst of this incredibly tense and stressful flight, where in, in many ways this crew was fighting for their lives, you got to see something you'd never seen before. What was that experience like? Uh, well, it, it was obviously, uh, to me, great to have the opportunity to even just loop around the moon. Uh, Jack uh, and I did a lot of sightseeing as we went around the backside. Lovell, who had already circled the moon in Apollo 8, got a little impatient with all the photos his shipmates were taking. And I told him, if, they, you know, if we don't get back, you're not going to get them developed. You are basically running a bare bones operation at that time. You are shutting down everything you can because everything aboard that module drains power. And you need all the power you can, you can save. Exactly right. And we had to turn off all the electrical systems, and that's when the temperature kept dropping. We'd like you to uh, go down that power down procedure. We knew it was going to get as cold as a meat locker inside that spacecraft. So in other words, you're saying, look, guys, you're going to be cold and thirsty and hungry for four days. But you're going to go through that because if we do anything else, that you're not getting home. That's correct. So how cold did you get? It was about the temperature of your refrigerator. It got pretty miserable. We had uh, got out of storage all our spare underwear. So we had three sets of underwear on. What about food? How much food did you have? We didn't eat much food. Uh, we, and the water was freezing and the food was getting frozen too. Too cold to eat, too cold to sleep. I found out that I could be in front of the instrument panel, put my fingers together, close my eyes, and for about three minutes, be asleep. Wake up, refreshed. And so that's essentially the, actually the sleep that we got on the way home. April 15th, 30 hours after the explosion, something else threatened to kill them, something they couldn't even see. In layman's terms, your own exhalation. And the fact that the three of you breathing out were creating so much carbon dioxide that it was going to kill you. 
That, that's absolutely correct. Remember, the lunar module was only designed to support two men for two days. Its air purifiers were maxed out. The dead command module was still attached. They could get more filters there, but they were the wrong shape, square, and wouldn't fit the round openings in the LEM. And of course, it's a big engineering goof that we didn't have the same canister for both sides. We got to come up with a solution here. Engineers had to design an adapter, literally make a square peg fit in a round hole. They had to do it quickly, and they could only use what was on the spacecraft. Part of a flight manual, plastic bags, duct tape. They did a mock-up of it down on the ground in Houston, and then they told you basically how to do it, and you must have thought they were crazy. Yeah, they said, now take three feet of duct tape. And we said, what, three feet? They said, yeah, an arm's length of duct tape. <laughs> The strange-looking contraption worked. It saved their lives. And for two more days, cold, hungry, sleepless, the three astronauts hunkered down and willed their way home. At some point, Mission Control instructed you to stop sending your urine out of the spacecraft. And some people might think that's the ultimate indignity. These guys are in a tough enough strait as it is. What was the reason for that? Well, what they said was, we don't want any unbalanced force on the vehicles because we want to get you back in that free return course for a safe approach through the atmosphere and a landing on the so Earth. So when you expel urine... It would change the course a little bit. It's like a little rocket engine. So now you've got bags of urine floating around yeah, in, in, in the spacecraft as well. Yeah, let me try to, try to figure out where to put that. They all but stopped drinking water. Dehydration set in. Fred Hayes soon developed an infection and fever. That was all bad. But now, even as Earth loomed in the window, there was yet another crisis. They called up and said, we have extrapolated your course all the way back to the Earth and you're going to miss the atmosphere. You were by, drifting. Yeah, by 60 or 80 nautical miles, which meant, although they didn't say it, is that, hey, you're gone.